Uh, Genesis chapter 21. We're going to start there. I know. It's, I, I'm messing you guys up. I'm not putting the stuff up. It causes people anxiety. It's all right. Genesis 21. I want to talk to you today about wells. Wells. When I was growing up, we had a well. I don't know if your house has one. But at our house, uh, where I grew up, we had a farmhouse. And we had this well. And part of the well was, you know, this really long pipe that went down into the water table. And what would happen is you'd turn your faucets on and pressure would build up and then the water would come out. Never once growing up did my parents ever have the water tested. So there's a good chance I have like arsenic poisoning, lead poisoning, and all the other really great... Yeah, that's where all my hair went, so you guys know. Uh, <laughs> but we never had it tested. It always tasted a little bit like lead, but I kind of like the flavor of metal, so you get used to it pretty quick. So anyway, that was our water situation growing up with this well. And what happened is we couldn't run the shower or the sinks or anything else indefinitely because you would run the well dry. And this was an ongoing issue. Everything was interconnected. Our house was from the 1800s. If you flushed the toilet, you could hear someone scream who was in the shower. It was really great. But the well uh, was outside, and what would happen is it had a pump, and the pump would run when we turned the water on. The pump, though, was connected to electricity, and if we lost electricity, which we did pretty frequently because we lived in Mass, uh, in New England, right, we lose power pretty frequently, probably more up here than we did down there, but we definitely lost power. And when that would happen, the pump would lose its prime. What that means is that if there's air that gets into the system, it will not work right anymore. It can burn the motor out, it can cause all kinds of problems. So when I was young, maybe nine or ten, my father taught me how to prime the pump. And what you had to do is you'd go out and you'd lay on your belly and you'd take the thing off and you'd have to unscrew stuff and pour water in. So you had to add something to it to fix a problem that it had, and the problem it had was lack of that thing. We're going to talk about wells. And when I say we're going to talk about wells, we're going to talk about physical wells, but we're going to talk about metaphorical wells as well. Genesis 21. I just want to skim over something quick with you to set up the stage for what we're really going to focus on today. Abraham makes a covenant with a man named Abimelech. Abimelech is the leader of the Philistines. He is the leader of a kingdom that Abraham is existing in. And I thought, what more timely word is there that the Lord could give me than a peace accord between Palestinians slash Philistine. Palestine is the Romanized word for Philistine. Philistines and Jews. <coughs> Palestinians and Jews. There's murder and war and rumors of war. You guys, if you turn the news on, see it all the time. Oh, we can have peace. We'll give you your hostages back, but we want something in return. Oh, we can do this, but we want this. And these... these Covenants, these different agreements, these treaties are supposed to be set in stone. So we go all the way back before modern civilization, thousands of years ago, to a moment in time where Abraham is trying to make a covenant. He says this in verse 22. Came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I will swear. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me nor had I heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant, and Abraham sent seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. They make a covenant. They make an agreement. But Abraham brings up the fact that he had a well, and the servants of Abimelech stole the well. Now it's interesting, if you study that word Abimelech, it means king, that's what most people agree and just like uh, there were several Caesar, Augustus, 
or several uh, people who wanted to be lined up with different Roman emperors or Greek rulers, they would change their name, or uh, even in Egypt they would do that, and so you have like eight or MCs, and they would just take that title. So it's not necessarily the same man we're going to look at in the following section, but it is the same ruler or same position. Abimelech, that name, it means Ab, right? Ab is father in their language, and Molech. Molech is a false god. So to even say his name is to pronounce that Molech is the father of all. Oh, Abimelech, let's make a deal. Some of you just made a deal on Thanksgiving with your respective Abimelechs. Your respective people that went, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You went to a meal somewhere, and you prepared for war in advance. You knew when you walked into that room that something would be cooked wrong. You knew the turkey would be dry, and you knew the conversation would be even drier. You knew things would be uncomfortable. There's this young man that I mentor. He lives in New York now, and he, he called me to tell me. He, he does this thing where he stirs the pot. Any of you guys have someone like that in your family? They just lobs these softballs up at the table just to see what will happen and who will get angry. And so he found out that his girlfriend's family are all like really left-leaning. And so he kept bringing things up about Bidenomics and about Kyle Rittenhouse and other things. And he just watched the color drain from their faces and the rage <laughs> build up. And they're like, oh, you're so incensed. And he caused this division. But it was a common meeting place. It was supposed to be a place where you could feel loved and accepted, a place where you could feel fed and taken care of, a place where you could go and enjoy the fellowship with people that you're supposed to love. And he was stealing water from their well. He was poking just to see what would happen. He was instigating and stealing something from them, whether he realized it or not. He was violating an unspoken covenant that many of us have, which is when we have a holiday, we don't talk about two things, politics and religion. <laughs> we just don't do it in our culture. Just don't do it because it's going to lead to war, and it always seems to. Abraham is frustrated because he's dug the well. He's put the time in. He's put the effort in. He's found the water, and it's been stolen. Interesting to me, is that to us, water doesn't seem like that big a deal because we have instant access to it all the time. But in their culture, in their time frame, what you would find is that the people who owned the water had a better economy, had a much stronger governance of the region, and had control over everything going on around them. Well, why is that? Because if I want my sheep to drink, I have to come to you. If I want my uh, servants to drink. If I want to know there's clean water that I can drink, I have to come to you and beg you or come up with some agreement to access it. So it stands to reason oftentimes that when the water dries up in a well, it creates quite a bit of concern. There's a problem, a serious problem. And that problem might be the water table. It could be a famine. It could be something else. But in Genesis 26, we read a story about Abraham's son, Isaac. That's the one who was laid on the altar to be sacrificed. That's the one who watched his father. And that's the one who clearly is following in his footsteps. Isaac, in Genesis 26, is a man who is following in his father's footsteps. He is digging actual literal wells in the same places his father did. And he is not finding good things. Starting in verse 12, it says this, he, Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. They have filled them with earth. I was uh, driving here. We took two cars because we have a meeting after. And uh, Anna rode with me and Caleb rode with Vicky. 
And she asked me, as she does all the time, what are you going to preach on? And I said to her what I always say, just to give her anxiety, I'm not sure yet. I'll figure it out when I get there. But she kind of like, and I said, oh, I'm talking about wells. And she's like, oh, <laughs> thank you for at least having something. I was like, I thought you were preaching. She said she was willing to show you guys her slides on avocados, but decided that probably wouldn't be a good choice that we're doing for school right now. But I was talking to her about wells, and I said to her, can you imagine living in an arid environment like this? Being thirsty. Knowing that your father has already prepared something for you. Traveling there, bringing all your cattle or whatever you have trailing you, getting to that thing, looking down and seeing dirt inside. How disheartening would that feel? Oftentimes, we, we have a tendency as Christians, as believers, to look at how other people have done things, decide that must be what God wants for us, follow in their footsteps, get to that thing, and when we look down, there is no living water inside. There's dirt. There's earth. And on the inside of the well, there's dirt, but on the outside of the well, there's discouragement. There's depression. There's war. There's frustration. Because someone has gone out of their way to provoke us by filling our wet places with something to dry them out. Go away from us. You're much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug, dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they quarreled with him. How would you have responded in that moment? How do you respond in that moment even now? When confrontation appears, and it comes from a direction or a place you already don't respect, how do you respond? When something happens in life, and someone has done something to violate something that is deeply important to you, how do you respond? I think if we're honest, most of us, our first instinct is to fight. I would have fought. You already just took all that time to dig something that already belonged to you, that was filling up, and now these people are antagonizing you, and they're going to criticize you, and they're going to say, you don't belong here, uh, after you did all the work, and on and on it goes. And then you look at the word, and what does it say? He doesn't fight them. He doesn't get angry. He moves to the next well. He moves to the next well. The herdsmen quarreled with Isaac herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and he shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. I can understand why he goes from the first well to the second. I can understand why he goes from the second to the third. There's infighting, there's problems with herdsmen that live near there. There's all manner of things going on. I, all of that makes sense logically. What I could not figure out is why he goes from Rehoboth, which means spaciousness. It's a place of spaciousness, a place God has finally given him a land he can graze, to Beersheba. I could not figure it out. And I wrestled with it because I said, Lord, you don't tell him to leave. It doesn't say he's supposed to leave. He isn't in a fight. He's finally in a place where there's peace, where there's provision, where God is giving him everything he has need of. 
and all his servants. And understand, when I say him, I mean collectively, they're like a little mini nation that's walking around in this area. It's not just him. It's all the people who work for him. It's his family. It's his children. On and on, they are going around, and they are set to inherit what God has provided and promised to his family. He's supposed to be getting access to something that God has given him, but the wells are dry, and he has to redo the work. He redoes the work, and it creates problems. As the problems come in, and the people who are trying to captive uh, or steal the area uh, and control the area come in, he's forced to go again and again and again. And sometimes I think in life, it feels that way. That we have battles that come up. We go, oh, man, that went well. I did a great job. I didn't swear this time. It's fine. You don't have to raise your hand. I know who you are. I didn't swear this time. I didn't scream at my kid this time. I didn't quit my job and storm out this time. I didn't do this and do that. And we see these little glimpses of what the real thing should be, but they're shadows and they're discouraging because there's never any real peace until we go to the place God expects us to be. We must go to the place where God is waiting for us. God is waiting for him there. He meets him there. Why doesn't God meet him in Rehoboth? It's spacious. It's nice. I don't know. I don't have an answer. Scholars don't have an answer. But what I do know is this. It's not where he found God. It wasn't the strife. It wasn't the contention. It wasn't the fights. It wasn't the spaciousness. It was a place where God calls him. He goes to Beersheba. Listen to what happens, because I feel like many of us, if we're honest, and we want to fight, because that's what we do as people, we want to fight, or we avoid confrontation, but someone else fights and wins, and we just learn to live with it. You know who you are. There's a balance. Listen to what happens. Abimelech came to him, came to Isaac, is who they're talking about. They came, he came to him from Gerar with Ahuzeth, one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, since you hate me and have sent me away from you? And they said, We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm since, you have not, since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but, got, but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. Why is it that as they come to him, he doesn't explode. I would have exploded. I would have gotten frustrated. I would have said, you already had an agreement with my father. You broke that agreement. Now you're coming to me and saying, oh, let us make an oath with you. Let us make a covenant. We sent you away because we were angry that you were doing better than us. And now you come back to me and you're trying to make an oath. And I wonder how many times in our lives we've been in conflict with someone We've separated, and they come back and want to make things right, but they don't quite know how. And rather than being the bigger person, we would say in our culture, right, rather than making the decision and helping them, rather than doing the thing that God has called us to do, which is reconcile, or as Paul says, live peaceably among your neighbors as much as is possible, rather than do that, we turn our back to them, we unfriend them, we write them off and decide anything they said in the past is a lie. People tend to draw lines in the sand when others violate their word. Now imagine that not only have they violated their word, but the word wasn't even to you, it was to your father. And we just don't associate with those types of people. 
We don't talk to people who have that background. We don't spend time with people that have that color skin. We don't spend time with people or do things or take risks that way in this family. In this family, we do this. And oftentimes we do things like our fathers before us and go back to the same places and think, surely if we dig deep enough, we can finally get what we need. And what we will often find is that at the bottom of all the digging, there's conflict. And if there's not just conflict, there's infighting. So what were your parents' wells and what were mine? I can tell you, for my mom, her well was alcohol. And I got to watch what it did. And I got to watch God deliver her. And I got to watch him bring her to a place of sobriety. But there was a path in between there of dry, dry soil. In a place that should have been a well of water that would have nourished. Instead, we found that because that's what her father did. And that's what her grandfather did then it was easy for her to go to that well. And each of us has wells that the people before us have set up. And there is always going to be a temptation to go to those things because they're already there. We don't have to dig them. We don't have to do the work. There's something really nice about knowing you don't have to do the work. You can just show up and someone will do it for you or someone already has. That's why most of us don't change our own oil. Don't laugh, Jeff. I said most of us. What is it that he is doing? They're reconciling a broken covenant. They're reconciling a relationship. They're fixing something that has been perverted and has gone the wrong way. So, swear an oath. He swears an oath. He feeds them. So not only does he be the bigger person. He shows them hospitality in the middle of all of it. But I want you to pay special attention to what happens next because I think it's fascinating. Verse 32 says this, And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. In Hebrew, er, E-R, means water. It means well. It means spring. Anything that is a bubbling brook, a spring is er, which is why Beersheba is the name of the place. Bear meaning water. Some, well, I won't say that. But Beersheba is the name of the town. They dig a well, and nothing happens. He swears an oath, forgives these people, does the right thing, and then something amazing happens. The provision comes when he unstops his heart. The provision comes when he unstops his relationship. The provision comes when he's willing to humble himself, even though he's not the one who violated the covenant to begin with. And I wonder, as we go to war on Thanksgiving, which of us can think of people even now that maybe we need to humble ourselves even though we weren't the one who did it and restore the relationship. I don't know about you, but I've been in some pretty contentious holiday meals. I have been at someone's house on a Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, nice, nice man. Thanksgiving. Robin Mel left and I turned Southern. Been at someone's house on a Thanksgiving. We drove there. It was two hours away. I don't remember who said it, but somebody said something to my wife. Go back in the car. (laughs) Drove two hours back home. Left it. Been to some contentious holiday meals. Seen some things happen at meals that Maybe we don't really talk about that often. But what I do think happens is God, if you let him, will bring you to a place where maybe you have to make your own way, but making your own way doesn't come at the expense of the relationship that's been messed up to begin with. In John 4, we'll wrap up with this. John 4 we read about another man at a well. This time, it's Jesus. 
he says to a woman of Samaria to give him a drink. Maybe you know the story. John 4, 7 says this, A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For, Jesus, or for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Did you catch who put the well there? It's not Abraham and it's not Isaac. It's Jacob. Do you know who Jacob is? Isaac's son. Follows his dad's example. Creates a well in a place where it needs to be created. And that is the thing that gives a woman a unique opportunity to interact with Jesus. And not just any woman, a Samaritan woman. So she has two strikes against her in their culture. And he's Jewish and he acknowledges her. And that alone would have been a huge shock. But then beyond that, she says to him, you didn't even bring anything to pull water out of this well with. And what he says is inside of you, will be a fountain of living water. If you look at that word fountain in the original language, it's referencing a buildup of pressure that will explode from within you. And I thought about what Jen said about the willingness to go out and share what we have. And all I could keep going back to in the back of my mind, in the back of my heart over and over, is this thought that there are a lot of parched people around here. And there's a lot of dammed up, earth-filled wells all over this place. Now, to be fair, because it's New England, they've become karate studios. They've become rec centers. But there are these empty churches all over the place with lots of chairs and lots of good intentions and very little life. And if we don't let the Holy Spirit bubble up inside of us, if we don't let that fountain come up in each of us, there is no life in a well that's full of earth. There is no life in a region that doesn't want a drink of water. See, the problem is when you look around, it's very easy to decide that people just don't want it. But I wonder if that's because they've never tasted it. I wonder if it's because they've never experienced what it means to be loved in such a way that you can have a problem with diabetes in the corner of the room in a group this small and have, what, half the congregation swooning over you trying to make sure you're okay because you clearly aren't doing well health-wise. I can't tell you from sitting in the back the number of people I watched come over to Mark and try to help him. Coming back and talking to me, do we need to get him insulin? Do we need to do this? Do we need to do that? Guys, that is amazing, and that is a form of love that there are people, so many people outside these walls that have never experienced. Not only do people know the pain of being cut off from their families during these times, especially holidays, but they experience the burden and the hurt of feeling like they don't matter to anybody. And that is going on all over our culture. People are unsure of their identity any longer. They don't know who they are. But our Bible tells us they were made in the image of God, which means we have an answer to that question. Do people want to hear it? Probably not. There are a lot of people that won't want to hear it, but there are people that will. And the people that will are worth fighting through the people that won't. And if we're not willing to continue to dig and see water come in, and have fountains bubble up, and see the hand of God come down on this place, then we ought to just dam the well up and move along. But I don't think that's what we're supposed to do. 
And I hope that's not what you think we're supposed to do. I think what we're supposed to do is continue to put our trust in the person who provides the water to begin with. The person who can cause living water to bubble up inside each of us, no matter how dry something looks. The person that can make a well be a place of life and not death. The person who can make a well spring forth with aggressive force like a fountain of living water. And I hate when God gives me words like this. And let me tell you why. Because then I read the word and I say, do I have a fountain of living water? (laughs) Am I even saved? What kind of mistake is this? But the reality is that fountain's going to look a lot different in each of us. And it's supposed to. And that's awesome. Because God has made each of us unique. There are people who should be obnoxious, loud fountains. There are people that should be fountains that trickle. But guess what? They both provide living water. And so my question, because I love to ask you guys questions, as you know, is this. Number one, have you settled into a routine that has been laid out before you by your father or earthly father, spiritual father, whatever, Uh, but have you settled into a routine that's dry and doesn't have living water in it? A routine that just doesn't incorporate God, doesn't incorporate restoration, doesn't incorporate uh, his healing power in relationship, his healing power in right living, uh, his kingdom doesn't incorporate his headship over you. You can come. His headship over you. Have you settled into a rhythm of, well, I'll just go through this week until I reach the next one. I'll go through this week until I reach the next one. And life is feeling dry because I've been there. Are you there? The second question I have for you is this. Are you willing to make things right with people that you've alienated, even if you weren't the one who did it? There's a fun one. We can all chew on that one a little bit. And the third one is this. How much do I truly believe that when Jesus comes into my life, he creates a fountain of living water? A fountain of living water that is good for my soul, that is nourishing, that is going to wet the dry places, that is going to encourage, that is going to build up the people around me, uh, that is going to build me up from the inside out so that I pour out on others. Because, my friends, there's no one who wants a drink from an empty pitcher. And if we don't spend time with the Lord and get filled up, you better believe when we go to pour out on people, all they're going to get is dust. And that is probably not going to fill their wells up. All around you, you see husks, you see dried up wells, our culture, our town, the different things going on around us feel so stressed out and so tenuous all the time. And it can cause anxiety if you don't like confrontation. And even if you like confrontation, you can feel anxious going into the grocery store and seeing the prices of things and seeing the way people look down on you and feeling the the thoughts and the different ways of insignificance that come in and the way society works to beat us down to make us feel like we don't have a hope. But I serve a living God. I serve a God who's alive forevermore. I serve a God who is not only living water, but has promised to fill us to overflowing if we'll let him. And the question is, will you? Will you let him? Will you let him make you a witness as someone witnessed to you? Will you let him bubble up inside and pour out on others and fight through the dry wells and be willing to ask forgiveness even when you don't feel like you did anything wrong to get to the thing God has for you because the thing God has is always greater than what you can do so we're going to pray and I want you to think about those questions Lord I thank you for these precious saints I thank you Lord that you are such a good God that you love each and every one of us Lord, I pray there be some people who would make some phone calls after this to family and loved ones. 
There'd be some people that would bring about restoration even though they feel like they didn't do anything wrong. There'd be some people that would be willing to challenge what culture says about just turning off other humans, about just cutting off relationships because we don't like them. Help us, God, to be mature believers. Help us to be people who realize that you have called us to pour living water out. You've called us to encourage everyone, to lift people up, to bring people into right relationship with you. And Lord, there's entire generations of people right now that are dying and they don't know you. And we can make whatever excuse we want, oh God, but the reality is there is a hell and people are going to it. And I ask, oh God, that we would start to become passioned by the idea that if I don't say something, it could cost someone everything. Lord, help us, I pray to be a church that witnesses, to be a church that is not ashamed of the gospel, to be a church that is not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, sometimes we go to wells that look good, but they're not. We go to wells that seem like they'll sustain us, but they won't. We're weary and we're tired, so we go back to the same old wells hoping to get a drink just to quench our thirst, but they're dry and they've been filled up either by our enemies or our friends. Lord, would you help us to move past the wells that you haven't instructed us to go to? The wells that you haven't placed there, maybe our fathers did. Would you help us, Lord, to move forward and be willing to deal with the difficulties, to be willing to face the ever-present fights and frustrations we encounter? Would you be willing, Lord, to live within us as you've promised and bubble up living water in each of us? that we may never thirst again. That we may never thirst again, oh God. That you, Jesus, would be the sustainer. You would be the one we give all our praise and honor and glory to. That you would be the lifter of our heads and that you would be glorified in our lives. We thank you, we praise you. We pray your blessing on each and every person here. Be with Mark, O oh God. Give him strength of body. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen.